All righty. Well, welcome back for part two of our civil rights uh, unit. Uh, this lecture is is our second lecture, um, and today we're going to be taking a look at the beginnings, the early roots of the civil rights movement, and in particular, the African American civil rights movement uh, that probably most of you think about when you hear the term civil rights movement. Um, in our first lecture, we covered kind of the under, underlying circumstances, right? Those domestic policies, the new frontier under Kennedy uh, and the great society plans under uh, LBJ. And so understand that again, the whole point of a civil rights movement is a group of people that feel like they have been left out, a group of people that feel like they're not being treated equally. Um, and they're, they're not saying that they want to overthrow the government. They're not saying they want to, you know, completely redo everything. They're just saying that they want a seat at the table. They want to be allowed in. They want to be a part of mainstream society, right? If we use, uh, you know, LBJ's great, great society, the, the, the civil rights movement would say, we want to be part of that society. We want to be allowed into that society. And so today uh, we're going to start taking a look at the, the early foundation, some of the roots of uh, this movement, because again, it would be wrong to think or to assume that the civil rights movement just magically starts uh, in the late 50s and in the 1960s, right? It didn't just come out of nowhere. Uh, it doesn't just spring up overnight. It's not like overnight, one night, African Americans woke up and decided, hey, you know what, we think we ought to try and, and get e equality, right? This is something that we've been talking about pretty much every unit since the beginning of the year, right? This, this desire for equality uh, and this, this fight for uh, recognition as equals, right? There, there's the recognition under the law and the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, but then comes Jim Crow. And, and so the reality is that life was not equal. They were not being treated the same. And so we want to look at where kind of the, the buildup to the main movement, right? What we know today as, as the civil rights movement, when you think about the work of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, Malcolm X, right? Uh, Rosa Parks, when you think about those things, we need to understand what comes before them, right? And, and then the early days of their movement. So that's what we're looking at today. Uh, so let's go ahead and let's dive in. Something to understand again is this idea of separate but equal, or what we would call de jure segregation, which I'll, I'll talk more about that phrase de jure in a moment, but, but separate but equal. But remind yourself, since 1896, since the court, Supreme Court decision in Plessy v. Ferguson, uh, the, the Supreme Court in 1896 in Plessy v. Ferguson said that legal segregation was allowed as long as you provided equal facilities for the different races, they said, right? As long as if, if you had a, uh, for example, if you, as the picture there shows, if you're at a, at a bus stop or a train depot, um, if you had a waiting room for uh, your white passengers, so long as you had a waiting room for your African-American passengers, you could segregate them. That, that's what Plessy v. Ferguson said. It said that separate separate but equal was allowed. The reality is that we know today, again, in hindsight, we can look back. People knew it then too. It's not like they, they didn't know it. They just, there were certain people in power who chose to ignore the reality. But the reality is that these facilities for African-Americans were rarely, if ever, of an equal quality. Most often they were a poorer quality. They were underserviced in comparison to their, the facilities for whites. They, they were not well taken care of. They were not uh, in, in prime condition, right? We know that. We, we understand that, that the facilities for African-Americans were often, they were, they were subpar. They, they weren't something that anyone would want to use, nor should they have been subjected to having to use them. This kind of segregation, though, we need to understand this kind of segregation is called de jure segregation or segregation in the law or by the law, right? There's explicitly a law that says you, you know, African Americans cannot be in the same theater, in the same, uh, you know, train car, in the same waiting room. Uh, African American children cannot go to the same schools as white children, right? There, it's written into the law. And Plessy versus Ferguson, that decision said that so long as the law was written uh, that, and that required equal facilities, it was legal, right? That is legal segregation, de jure segregation. But there's another kind of segregation. It's not just de jure segregation. We also have what's known as de facto segregation or segregation in fact or in, or, or in reality, right? And, and this this is maybe a little harder to understand, but it's, it's segregation that happens even when there's no law. 
right? It, it, segregation, we have to understand, we, we often pick on the South and, and don't, don't mishear me. The, the South is deserving of the criticism it's gonna get. But you have to understand that in this time period, it's not just the South that is segregated. It's not just the South that has prejudice in this country. It's the North, it's the West, it's the East, all throughout our country. There's issues with segregation and, and, and racism at the time, right? And, and this discrimination. And so de facto segregation is segregation that exists in places even where there were no laws explicitly allowing it or even mandating it, right? It's, it's segregation here is not mandated. It just kind of happens. And, and it could be for a couple of reasons. It, it could be the result of custom and tradition, right? It could just be that over time, groups of people that had similar beliefs moved closer together. And so you just end up with these, these neighborhoods, uh, what we would call ethnic enclaves, right? You end up with neighborhoods of people that are all from the same culture in one area and then another culture in another area, right? They, they may have self-segregated, right? There, there could be cases of that where it was by custom or tradition. It could also just be the remnant of old laws. Maybe there used to be a law uh, mandating segregation and maybe that law is gone, but the effects are still there, right? Uh, the example, prime example of this is as you can see in that image, that little chart there, residential living patterns, or in other words, ethnic enclaves, right? Left over from these, what we would call ghetto laws, right? The, 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 the laws that early in our country's history and persisting throughout a lot of it, uh, certain laws for immigrants, right? Immigrants from certain countries had to live in certain regions, right? Uh, you, that's how we end up with places in these big cities. If you've ever been to a large city like Los Angeles or Chicago, uh, San Francisco, right? You end up with little portions of town that maybe today we call like Chinatown or Little Italy, right? Um, and, and why are they like that? Why is it that you have this little neighborhood uh, where, where the Italians all lived and thrived? Why is it that you have this particular area of town where Chinese immigrants all came together? Did, it's not like they you know, planned it. It's not like it was like, hey, this is the neighborhood we want, so we're gonna go there. There used to be laws that mandated they live there. Now, even though those laws are gone, they're still gonna go live there. Why? Because there's people who speak the language or have their same customs, right? De facto segregation is segregation that happens in fact or in reality, right? Today, we don't have, the segregation is, is illegal. But you know, being in high school, for sure, you know that when you walk around campus, people hang out in cliques, right? People kind of just naturally group together. And they could be around a common interest, right? You could have your, your jocks, uh, you could have, you know, your, your the, the people who uh, uh, maybe you have a group that really loves to read. And so you have maybe a book club, right? It could just be the same neighborhood, right? They grow up in the same block. Elementary schools are a good way, right? Maybe you've just all been together since you were in first grade and you just worked your way up the system together and now you're friends, right? But you know that everybody kind of groups off. Nat there are, sometimes there's these natural groupings. And so de facto segregation or segregation in reality or in fact, there may not be a law that says it, but it's happened. And whether maybe that's because of old laws or old customs or just human nature to wanna to be around people that are like us, that have similar values and interests, right? Either way, both types of segregation existed in the United States. You had those areas of, of the country that were forced to be separate and you had other portions that remained separate even though there was no mandate. For their part, the NAACP, right, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, like we said, it's not like the African Americans have just been sitting around, you know, doing nothing about this. They've been fighting back. And, and since 1909, the NAACP had been challenging a lot of these segregation laws, the, the de jure segregation. They'd been challenging that stuff in court. And they'd had some successes, not many, but they had a few. And one notable one, Norris v. Alabama of 1935, uh, said that excluding African-Americans from jury, juries violated their right to equal protection under the law, that they were a part of the community of peers, right? That you are entitled to a jury of your peers and they live in, in your area, They're, they could be your peers, right? And so to exclude them uh, violated their rights and violated the rights not only of the, the jurors, the, the African-Americans not being allowed to serve on juries, but also the rights of the accused. Uh, you were being denied a, a truly representative uh, group of your peers. And so that's a win for the NAACP. That's a win for African Americans to be allowed into juries. It sounds silly, but that's a part of our civic life. Everyone complains about jury duty, but in a society that wants to have law and order and wants to have 
uh, you know, access to this kind of legal uh, um, defense, right? We are reliant on it, on jury trials. And so we need people to serve on juries. It, it is a civic duty. Part of being a citizen of this country is, is doing your civic duty, voting, jury duty, paying taxes, right? We may not like it, but it's a big deal, right? This, this Norris v. Alabama case is, is more than just like, hey, welcome to the misery that is jury duty. It's, hi, welcome to a portion of life that you've been excluded from, right? That's the goal of the civil rights movement. Keep that in mind. Don't lose that, right? The civil rights movement, the whole goal is for a group of people who have been left out of society or been, been kept away from things. It's their effort to try and be allowed into society, allowed back into the mainstream. This is a win for them. On top of that, since the 1930s, we can look back at the 19th, starting in the 1930s, and we can see African American political power on a gradual incline. Why? Well, following things like the Great Migration, which we've talked about in previous units, following the end of World War I, right? You have all of these African Americans who leave the South, right? They move north, they move west for jobs during the war, even before the war. And so now these northern cities have larger African-American populations. They become a very noticeable block of people and politicians are forced to reckon with them. They can't just ignore them. They can't ignore this whole group of people that are gonna vote in elections. And so northern politicians are forced to start paying attention. When a politician has to pay attention to you, that, that, that means you have political power, right? And African-Americans begin to have that greater influence. On top of that, during the 1930s under FDR, many African-Americans benefited from the New Deal programs. And as a result, they began to support the Democratic Party. FDR was very good to them. African-Americans voted for FDR overwhelmingly every time he was reelected. The African-American community helped carry him to victory. It's not like they were just part of the group. They were a major influence in getting him reelected over and over and over again. They have this massive political influence that cannot be ignored. And they're throwing their weight behind the Democratic Party, which is a change and a shift. And we've talked about this kind of shift in political parties before, but, but that's a change. And what it does to the Democratic Party is it gives the northern wing of the Democratic Party, those that are inclined to believe in civil rights, to be anti-Jim Crow, it gives them enough support to, to counter those southern Democrats that we've been talking about, those southern Democrats that later would become the Dixiecrats, right, who favored segregation. This, it, 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 and essentially, you have these two sections of the Democratic Party, and starting in the 1930s with African Americans backing the Democrats, backing candidates like FDR, there's going to start to force this shift. Those pro-segregation, pro-Jim Crow Southern Democrats are going to start to get pushed out of the party. And we'll talk about it in later units, but eventually they will leave the Democratic Party permanently, and they will merge with the Republican Party. And, and that influence, that, that shift, right? The, the African-American movement to the North and the West forces the Democratic Party to, to begin to really change its focus. Instead of being this Southern Democratic pro-segregation pro, uh, party, the Democratic Party begins to be the party of civil rights and begins to be the party that's advocating for uh, the end of segregation, the end of Jim Crow. That's because of the African-American influence. That's not, it, it's not, not like the Democrats just woke up one day and decided to, to you know, throw African-Americans a bone and start you know, fighting against the Southern members of their party. No, it's the African-Americans who began to put their political weight behind this party and started to lead the change to start, to start influencing that change. Certainly during World War II, African-Americans used that new political influence to help end discrimination in wartime factories. Not only did they help end discrimination in wartime factories and, and to help them get jobs, they, they ended discrimination sort of kind and of maybe a little bit in the military, right? They got to be, they, they went from at the start of World War II not being allowed in combat roles to by the end of World War II being allowed in combat. We end up with some of the most decorated soldiers, the Tuskegee Airmen, because of that, right? They fight for their opportunity to be treated equally. And that happens as well in wartime factories. You have the Congress of Racial Equality Corps, uh, led by James Farmer and George Hauser, that begin to use 
uh, union type strategies like sit-ins to protest, to protest for opportunities to work, to protest against segregation even. And what we see is that during World War II, this group core led by Farmer and Hauser, they successfully integrate several restaurants, theaters, and other public facilities in Northern cities, including Chicago, Detroit, Denver, and Syracuse. They get, they get the, the, the jour segregation ended in these cities, these the, you know, legal segregation, segregation by law. They get, it, they get it done away with. They get these private businesses, restaurants and theaters and the like to stop segregating because of their action, because of their effort, right? It's not just a, a, a it's not a, a pity thing. It's not a gift. They are advocating for themselves. They are working at it. They're trying to change minds and they're successful. And certainly that continues after World War II. After World War II, uh, Thurgood Marshall, he's the chief counsel for the NAACP. Thurgood Marshall will go on to be um, our first African-American uh, associate justice in the Supreme Court. Uh, but here after World War II, he is the, the chief counsel or the head attorney, the head lawyer uh, for the NAACP. He's going to turn the NAACP's attention to ending segregation in public schools, right? They're, they have a choice to make. They want to end segregation, but it's about strategy. What area can they focus on, right? It's hard to, to fight on all fronts, right? We've talked about different wars in this class before. Um, and one of the things we've talked about is, is the more fronts you add, the more the, the more uh, areas you have to fight in, right? Think about World War II, we had to fight in Europe and in the Pacific, right? The more of those battlefronts you add, the harder the war is, the more spread thin you are. And so Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP turn their attention. They wanna end segregation everywhere in all public spheres, but they're, they're gonna choose to focus on public education, public schools. If they can end segregation in public schools, they feel like that's a good first step. That's a good place to target. And so they are. They're going to turn their attention there and, and they're going to get, they're going to be successful. In 1954, the Supreme Court case of Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. Now, the, something to, to note about these cases. Brown refers to Linda Brown. That's the name of, of the, 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 um, the, the, uh, child that's that's suing right you have linda brown uh her story is this: she was denied admission to her neighborhood school because of her race because she was african-american uh, and she was told that she could enroll in the all african-american school across town right that would be as if if you lived in uh cedarwood's boundaries uh if we said you couldn't go you couldn't go to cedarwood uh because of the color of your skin you had to go all the way across town uh you had to go somewhere in fresno unified Right. If you had to, you had to go all the way over there. Right. You couldn't go to the school in the neighborhood you lived in. You had to go somewhere else. Right. That's essentially what they tell her. Right. That she can't go to her neighborhood school. She has to go somewhere else because of the color of her skin. And so naturally, she sued. The NAACP took up the case. And and really, something to keep in mind is this Brown v. Board of Education case is is really a lot of cases all smashed together. Right. It it goes under the title of Brown for Linda Brown, uh, because every Supreme Court case has to have some sort of designation, some sort of, of name. Uh, you can't just call it, you know, like the, the education cases, right? They can't have a vague name. They have to have a very specific uh, name. And so she is the named complaint, uh, Brown. Uh, but this is a ser series of several cases. Uh, in the next slide, you'll see a picture of all of the children whose cases this was a combination of, right? But they combine these cases and in a unanimous decision, by the Warren Court, but in a unanimous decision, they decide that segregation in public schools was in fact unconstitutional. Now, this is important. Just like uh, in presidential elections, when there's a mandate, right? When, when somebody wins in a landslide, we, we call that a mandate, right? We say that that president has a mandate. The American people clearly want what that president uh, is offering. Uh, and so, you know, Congress should get in line and do it. When, a, when the Supreme Court issues a unanimous decision, that is a very powerful thing. They are together all saying 9-0, we agree with this, right? Segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. In fact, they said it this way, and remember, you don't need to copy down the quote, but they said it this way in their decision. They said, in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. 
separate education facilities are inherently unequal. You cannot separate children based on the, the color of their skin in schools. Public education has to be open to all students. You can't send them somewhere else just because of the color of their skin. In 1955, a year later, the Supreme Court added, they added on to this decision and what, uh, if, you, if you study this further, you'll, you'll come to call, uh, you'll come to know that there's Brown v. Board of Education 1 and Brown v. Board of Education 2, right? Brown v. Board 1 is 1954, Brown 2 is the 1955 add-on. Uh, and they added that school districts should proceed with desegregating themselves. And they said with all deliberate speed. Now here's one of the fallbacks. Here's one of the problems with the Brown decision. Hear me loud and clear. It's a groundbreaking decision, right? It's a very critical decision. This idea that schools cannot be segregated, right? That is now officially the policy of the Supreme Court. They're saying it's unconstitutional to separate students based on the color of their skin. But here's the problem. We've talked about this before. Laws are only as good as the people enforcing them. And the Supreme Court cannot enforce their own decisions. The Supreme Court gets to make decisions, but it's up to the executive branch. It's up to the president. Uh, it's up to, uh, up to the legislative branch. It's up to Congress to really carry out these decisions. And here's the problem. Their decision was vague. That language of with all deliberate speed, well, what does that mean? How soon does that mean? Some people who were opposed to it, right? Those, some of these Southern school districts that didn't want to integrate, they didn't want to, to, to end their segregation. They said, oh, okay, well, we're moving at a deliberate speed. It's just going to take us a while, right? And, and unfortunately, the vague language of the Brown decision allowed many school districts to remain segregated for several year, years. In fact, it's not gonna be until 1969 that the Supreme Court's gonna issue another ruling and say that immediately all school districts had to end uh, any segregation and it had to remain forever and always desegregated, right? It's gonna take years. It's gonna take 14 years before that happens. And so, yes, Brown is a foundational decision. It's a very important decision, but it doesn't have that immediate impact that we would hope, right? It's not like overnight schools were desegregated. And in fact, we'll talk about uh, uh, an issue around this, a, a school district that fought uh, uh, integration. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But Unfortunately, Southern resistance was more common than school integration. After Brown, Southern school districts were more likely to resist than to integrate. And in fact, many states uh, adopted what they call pupil assignment laws to get around the ruling. Um, it allowed, these laws allowed them to still segregate their schools using more elaborate requirements for enrollment besides race, right? Uh, you could boil it down and, and still somehow you know, all of the African-American kids were being forced to go to one school and all the white kids were going to another school. Uh, but they had a law in place that said that, you know, it had to do with your address or the birth date, or they had some way of getting around it, right? It's, it's just, it's the same thing that happened at, at the end of Reconstruction, right? The, we, the laws got put in place, those Jim Crow laws didn't violate the 13th Amendment, didn't have slavery in the name, but they still allowed essentially de facto slavery, right? These are de facto segregation laws. Uh, they don't explicitly say it, but it's, it, it's there, right? And the effect is the same. The African-American students still are segregated from the white students. And perhaps what is more shocking uh, is this Southern Manifesto. In 1956, you get this Southern Manifesto, 101 Southern members of Congress, Southern members of the House of Representatives, uh, they issue what the, and they sign this Southern Manifesto where they denounced the Brown decision. They said that the Supreme Court went too far. They had overstepped their boundaries. They didn't have the legal authority to do this. And they pledged to see it overturned. They pledged to do everything in their power as congressmen to overturn the Brown decision, to keep school segregation. It's an unfortunate reality in our history, but it's our history nonetheless. We, today, we celebrate the Brown v. Board decision as the, the, the deciding case, right? This, this separate education facilities are inherently unequal, that, that this doctrine of separate but equal has no place in education. That is a, that is a cornerstone uh, for, for all of us in education, right? This belief that every child gets to have access to an equal and equitable education. 
right? Nobody goes into teaching because they want to be, because they want to punish kids and, and and make life harder for some rather than others. We go into education because we believe every child has the, the ability and the opportunity and the right to learn, right? Brown is a foundational piece of that. And unfortunately, throughout the South, much of the South, the response was to resist, to fight back. Here you can see there are some images. You have Thurgood Marshall there on the top left. Uh, you have the, the children involved in the Brown case, right? The, all of their cases got put together in one case. Um, and there is Linda Brown. She's the, the third one there. If you start at the, the front uh, left and you work your way back, Linda Brown, there's the third child. And then there she is with her, her mother on the steps of the Supreme Court uh, with the headline, High Court Ban Segregation in Public Schools. Let's get in now to the, what we know as the, as the civil rights movement, the really the foundational pieces of the, the civil rights movement, the modern civil rights movement. Let's, let's look at the beginnings of it. It really starts with the Montgomery bus boycott, December 5th, 1955 to December 20th. Uh, you all probably have heard the name Rosa Parks. A lot of you probably think you know what happened. Um, for the purposes of our class, here's what you need to know, uh, Rosa Parks, does get did get arrested excuse me on december 1st 1955 she was arrested in montgomery alabama um it did have to do with a bus and it did have to do with uh her her seat um most people if you ask them they would tell you that she was just an old woman who was tired from her day at work and she didn't want to get up out of the uh the whites only section of the bus and that's that's not accurate um she was not in a whites only section she was in kind of this middle section that was uh, African-Americans were allowed to sit there, um, but it was kind of an understanding and kind of the rule of like, if there were white passengers without a seat, they got priority over those seats and the African-American passengers would have to move back. Um, the other piece of this is Rosa Parks wasn't alone. Uh, she also wasn't unaware. It's not like she was just some, some tired woman who sat on a bus and didn't want to get up. She knew what was happening when she was asked to get up, her and and three other passengers, when they were asked to get up, she knew what she was doing. She knew that by not getting up, she would get arrested. She knew uh, that that would be the case. But here's the thing. There is no Brown v. Board of Education decision without some sort of violation. You can't just go to court and sue because you don't like something. You have to have what's called standing. You have to have a reason to appear before the judge. Oftentimes in legal language, that means you have to be able to claim some sort of damage. The law has had to have impacted you somehow. If you're gonna challenge a law and say that the law is unconstitutional, you have, you have to have suffered some sort of loss as a result of that law, right? If, if Rosa Parks gets up and moves to the back of the bus, right? Uh, and then tries to go and challenge this law in court, she would get laughed out of court because the, the judge would say, well, you didn't have a damage. Right, moving to the back of the bus isn't a problem. You still got a seat. Okay, no, no damage. By being arrested, she now has a case. Right, she's going to face criminal charges, and she can challenge the law because there's now a court case. Right. So let's be very clear. Rosa Parks is not just some poor old woman who gets caught in the middle of a long day and just wants to sit down. She's she's a brave civil rights advocate who gets on that bus and when she is asked to move she knows exactly what she's doing she knows exactly the implications of what's going to happen uh, and she knows exactly the consequences of what her actions are and she she faces it anyway knowing the consequences she still resisted she is arrested her case uh, the NAACP gets permission from her to, to take up her case they use her case as a challenge to these Montgomery laws. They're gonna challenge the constitutionality of these segregated bus laws. In the meantime, while they're working their way through that process, another woman, Joanne Robinson, you can see her there at the top, top right. Uh, she is going to, on the day that Rosa Parks is scheduled to go to court, December 5th, she's gonna call on all of the African-Americans in Montgomery, Alabama to boycott to, to, to not use them, right? To, to boycott something means to avoid it or to, to not use it. Uh, she is going to uh, call on all of the African-Americans in Montgomery to boycott the Montgomery buses on the day of Park's trial, December 5th, right? And, and she's going to call on them to do it. She's going to organize them to do it. 
Uh, in fact, several African-American leaders are going to come together. They're going to form uh, the Montgomery Improvement Association, right? This is a group that's going to oversee this boycott and uh, represent the movement with city leaders, right? They're going to organize. They want to be organized. It's not just some random thing. It's not just one person calling for a boycott, right? This is a movement. The, the entire African-American community in Montgomery is going to organize, and they're going to be mobilized together, and they're going to appoint leaders to, to guide them and to handle negotiations with the city, right? When, when city leaders try and meet with them, they're going to send in their representatives, right? And they elect 26-year-old pastor, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, to lead them. And, and I include his, his PhD there because I think it's important to remember, uh, he was 26 years old. He was young. But he was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This was a man who was well-educated. He had his PhD in theology from Boston University, right? He is a man that is well-educated. He is well-respected. He's a very pious man, meaning he's very a, a very uh, uh, devoutly religious man. He's devoted to his faith uh, and to his call to the pastorate. He is, he's devoted to the church that he is leading. He's devoted to, uh, to, to his faith. But he is also devoted to this cause of civil rights. He is devoted to, to advocating for African-American people, and he has chosen to lead this group. He believes in nonviolent passive resistance. This is probably what you're most familiar with, right? Of all the civil rights leaders, we probably know Martin Luther King Jr. the best, or at least we think we do, right? We grew up in elementary school probably talking about him. Um, but this, this idea of nonviolent passive resistance, right? He's very influenced by, by Gandhi uh, and, and some other leaders. And, but he believes that, that you have to be nonviolent, that that's the answer, right? He said, uh, you can see that quote there from him. He says, we will soon uh, wear you down by our capacity to suffer. And in winning our freedom, we will, all, we will so appeal to your heart and conscience that we will win you in the process, right? That, that we will soon wear you down with our capacity to suffer. In other words, we're not fighting back. We're going to take the suffering. We're, we're going to take the punishment. Boycotting the buses, right? I, I know this is hard for us to wrap our minds around because we, we live in a suburb and, and suburbs are notorious for not uh, having, you know, uh, this dependence on public transportation as much. We do have good bus systems here, the facts and Clovis Roundup. Um, but really, if, if you've never been to like a big city, if you've never been to like Chicago or New York, not Los Angeles, certainly not LA, but really Chicago or New York, uh, with the subway or the L and the bus system, right? In those cities, it is more common to use public transportation. The, the weird thing is to have your own car, right? It, it's normal to just use public transportation. In Montgomery, Alabama, that, that would have been the case. Public transportation would have been a very critical piece to the lives of the citizens of Montgomery, to the people working in Montgomery, right? To walk everywhere, to commit to boycotting the buses and to walk places, that's that's a hardship, right? There's a reason you take the bus. It, it gets you there, right? And so by, by taking action in this boycott, they, they are going to suffer. And Martin Luther King Jr. is saying, we, we will suffer and you will see us suffering. And in winning our freedom, in, in fighting this long fight, this nonviolent passive resistance fight, in the end, we're going to win our freedom. But not only is he saying they're not only going to win their freedom, but by, by suffering, they're going to win the hearts and the conscience of the people that oppose them to begin with, right? They will win the support of the people who oppose them because the people who oppose them will, will not be able to ignore the way that these people have suffered and yet endured. And so King leads this group and this boycott that was supposed to be a day long, right? She called on them to boycott the day of Rosa Parks trial. This boycott lasts for over a year. You can see there December 5th of 1955, all the way to December 20th, 1956, for over a year, the African-American community in Montgomery, Alabama boycotts the Montgomery buses. This is crippling to the economy of Montgomery. All of that all of the, it costs money to ride the bus. They lose all of that money. They lose all of that money. And, and, and the city of Montgomery is forced to deal with this issue. They, they cannot afford to continue to lose money like this. The economic impact is, hard, it, it is felt, right? Uh, some, some would say that if you want to affect change, hit, hit somebody in their wallet. 
right? That's that's the change people respond to when their wallet is impacted. Uh, they feel it, right? When when they, they they no longer have the money, you, you feel that. The city lost so much money; they were forced to deal with this issue. Not only because of that, but also because in November of 1956, the Supreme Court struck down Alabama's bus segregation laws. They said that they were unconstitutional, and so not only was the city of Montgomery forced to change because of the Supreme Court decision, they were forced to change because they couldn't afford to not change. They needed the money. They needed the African-American community to ride the buses again. They needed that income. And so again, by taking action, they affect change. By taking action, they affect change. Now it's not widespread. Again, a law is only as good as the people uh, enforcing it. And several other Southern cities, they were able to avoid integrating their public transportation for a number of reasons, either because there wasn't ever a, a, a court case brought or because there just was nobody there to enforce it. And so again, it's, it's a victory. Montgomery is a victory. Hear me loud and clear. It's a massive victory. It's a very important victory. We'll talk more about that why on the next slide, but it's not widespread. It's not like overnight. Now all public transportation is integrated. Right, it starts off here and it's going to build and build and build. The Montgomery bus boycott's important not for all the not just because of all the reasons we just talked about, but in addition, it's important because it proves Dr. King's strategy of nonviolent protest could be successful. It proves that nonviolent protest could get the job done, that you didn't have to resort to violence. You didn't have to resort to these, these massive demonstrations. You could be passive, nonviolent, right? And it could work. Not only that, it proved that the, Amer the African-American churches were a very important piece of the puzzle, right? Every movement needs to be organized. Every movement, if it's going to succeed, uh, has to have some organizational structure. And it turns out that the churches the African-American churches provided natural organizing points. They were natural places for, for the community to come together. They were already going and, and they became natural points of connection, right? The, the churches, the local churches in these, in these communities offered spaces uh, for the community to come together to plan their, their protests, to, to mobilize volunteers, to provide forums for protesters to be heard, right? Dr. King wasn't the only minister there was a lot of ministers involved. In fact, in, 19, in 1957, Dr. King and several other Southern ministers and civil rights activists came together and they formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC. And it's going to be the SCLC that is going to lead this charge. Alongside the NAACP, you now have the, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and, and they are under the, the leadership of Dr. King, right? They're, Dr. King's going to be chosen to be their first president. He, they're going to set out to eliminate segregation and encourage African Americans to register to vote. They're going to they're going to challenge uh, the, the 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 segregation laws by getting African Americans registered to vote so they can vote in elections and vote in leaders that will get rid of segregation. Right? They're they're going to challenge this at the ballot box. In addition to all of the other forms of protest, they're going to use this movement to get people registered to vote to challenge laws at the ballot box. And, and this is a huge step, right? This, this organizing around African-American churches, the, the influence of these Southern ministers uh, and civil rights activists, the, the, the coming together, right? Uh, of, of these two groups, right? You have, you have their faith that draws them together, their common faith, you have their common struggle as a result of their, their shared life experience as, as African-Americans in the United States, you have so many things that are uniting them, making this group very powerful, making them very influential, but also giving them a community. It's very hard to, to be the one person who resists. It's very hard to be the, the one person standing up for justice. But when you are surrounded in a community, when you can put yourself together with other people, you have the opportunity to be to hold each other up, to lift each other up when times get hard, to support each other. And this community just continues to grow. Now, for his part, we're going to look at the different presidents' reactions 
uh, to civil rights, starting with Eisenhower. Uh, in the coming lectures, we'll look at Kennedy and we'll look at um, uh, LBJ. But starting with Eisenhower, Eisenhower, for his part, in, in terms of civil rights, uh, he was sympathetic to the civil rights movement. He believed, uh, he, he believed particularly, we'll talk more about it in a minute, in, in voting rights. He believed that everyone should be able to vote. Uh, he was sympathetic to the civil rights movement, but he believed that segregation and racism would just naturally end. He, he didn't believe it. He's quoted often as saying something to the effect uh, of, of that you, you can't, uh, a, a law won't change somebody's mind, that you can't change somebody's mind or their heart uh, with the law. Right. And so he was he, he he believed racism would just eventually go away, that as people changed and as their values changed, eventually racism would just go away. And he thought that that was good enough. Right. The, to the for the African-American community, they said that's that's not good enough. Right. Why should we have to wait? Why? Why should they have to to, to suffer any longer? Right. Why? Why should they wait for people's minds to change? Uh, they, 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 they didn't buy into that. Right. But Eisenhower. Uh, that's what he thought, and he didn't support protests. He didn't support initially uh, these, even these passive movements, right? He didn't support going to the courts. He didn't support uh, decisions like Brown or decisions uh, like the one in Montgomery. He, but he also knew, right? He was a man of, of principle. He was a military man, uh, and he knew the difference between what was optional and what was orders. He knew that as president of the United States, his orders were to enforce SCOTUS, the Supreme Court decisions, right? His job as president of the United States is to enforce the decisions of the Supreme Court. And he is a man that, that knows how to take orders. He's, a, again, a very decorated military man, right? The Supreme Allied Commander uh, in Europe during World War II, led our troops through World War II. He knows what it is to take orders. Even if you don't agree with the orders, you carry them out. And he knew his job was to enforce Supreme Court decisions. He's going to get tested because in September of 1957, the school board in Little Rock, Arkansas, was under a court order, a federal court order, to admit nine African-American students to Little Rock Central High School. The, the, these students become known as the Little Rock Nine. You can see them there in the center, uh, some of them there in the center. But the Little Rock Nine. These nine students were supposed to be allowed to go to Little Rock Central High School at the start of the 1957-58 school year. Uh, they were they Little Rock High Central High School in Little Rock was a, was an all white school prior, but again, the, the the federal court had ordered that these nine students had to be allowed to be admitted there. But Orville Faubus, the governor of Arkansas, who happened to be up for re-election at that time, he decided that he was going to base his re-election campaign uh, in his defiance of this order. He was going to be a defender of white supremacy, uh, and he was going to resist this court order. And so, in fact, instead of, instead of uh, as the governor of the state, instead of forcing the school district uh, to, to follow this court mandate, instead, he ordered the Arkansas National Guard, the, the, the troop, right, National Guard troops, uh, soldiers, he orders the Arkansas National Guard uh, to go to Little Rock Central High School and prevent those nine students from entering the school, to surround the school and to block their entry, to deny them the entry. On top of that, not only does the Arkansas National Guard show up, but a mob, a mob of, of predominantly white uh, Arkansas citizens arrive and they join the National Guard in surrounding the school to intimidate students and, and to deny them uh, entry into the school. This represents the first use of state troops to oppose the federal government since the Civil War, since the Carolinas and Virginia and Texas. For the first time since 1865, this is 1860, 1865, this is the first time state troops are being used to, to oppose the federal government. It's a show of force. And Eisenhower, again, he knows he has to nip this in the bud. He has to put an end to this. He cannot allow this governor in Arkansas to, to do this, to show up the federal government like that, to challenge the federal government like that. And so uh, 
uh, even when a, 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 a negotiations fail, right? Eisenhower tries to meet with Fabis, it goes nowhere. And so a, a federal court steps in and they order Fabis to remove the troops. And, and here's kind of the thing. He says, okay, sure. And Fabis, he removes the, the, the troops, but he allows the mob to stay. Can you imagine if you tried to come to school and there was just a mob of, of parents blocking your way to school, harassing you on the way to school, trying to attack you, call you names, throw things at you, right? If that were the case, if, 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 if your teachers, if, if admin, if we came to school one day and there was parents out here to block students from coming to school, you probably wouldn't come to school. We'd probably cancel school that day. You'd probably stay at home. Uh, in this current setting, you probably just go on Zoom, right? It wouldn't be safe. It's not, oh, it's not okay. That's not a safe environment for you. But Fabis, instead of putting students first, instead of, instead of complying, he, he, he obeys. He says, sure, I'll do what you said. You said to remove the troops. He leaves the mob. The mob sticks around. And when the nine students show up to school, they get inside. But shortly after they get inside, that mob starts attacking African-American reporters that are outside. They begin breaking school windows. They, they begin just doing what mobs do, being violent. And Eisenhower, again, he knows he has to step in. He has to do something. And so Eisenhower... Uh, he does something unprecedented. He orders the U.S. Army to send troops to Little Rock, Arkansas. On top of that, he does what's called federalize, federalizing the Arkansas National Guard. Uh, the National Guard, if you're not familiar, they're basically, they're like state troops, right? So the Arkansas National Guard, uh, they're, they're troops, they're like state military, right? But at any point, the federal government can, can federalize them. The president can call them up, basically, to federal military service, can call them into the army. And so that's what Eisenhower does. Those same troops that the governor sent to block those students get called up into the U.S. military. They're under federal authority. They're under their commander-in-chief, the president of the United States, and they are ordered to go back to that school and to make sure that those students get to school. And so along with uh, soldiers from the 101st Airborne uh, of the U.S. Army, the Little Rock, uh, or the, excuse me, the Arkansas National Guard and the U.S. Army show up. They encircle the school. They transport the students to school in military vehicles, and they escort them to class. And they keep the mob away. Bayonets on their guns, they, they, are, they are not messing around. And, and you could say on paper, Eisenhower was successful. He won that round, right? He beats Fabis. You can see there, Fabis standing there with, with a newspaper that says guns force integration, right? He, he's, he's beat. But here's the kicker. That's in September. And I know it's hard to believe, but school used to start in September instead of August. This was the beginning of the school year when all this is happening. Those troops had to stay in Little Rock for the rest of the year. They had to be there the rest of the year to ensure that these students could go to school. And Fabis, for his part, he's going to decry the whole affair as an abuse of federal power. As governor, he's going to continue to resist efforts uh, at civil rights reform. He's going to continue to resist. He's going to, going to continue to fight every step of the way. Uh, against it. He's a, he's a white supremacist. He, he does not believe in it. He believes uh, segregation is fine. He believes Jim Crow is fine. Uh, and he's governor of Arkansas until 1967. He is going to resist every step of the way. In 1960, he, he is so convinced that he's right. He, he launches a presidential campaign. He runs in the election of 1960. He runs for president as a member of the state's rights party, um, a, a far right white supremacist party. And he receives 44,000 votes, which is only 0.07% of the total votes cast in that election. And of course, you know, uh, Kennedy won that election. But 44,000 people believed in this guy's white supremacist agenda. They believed in his ideas. Most of them in Arkansas. That's where he got most of his votes was in his own state where he was governor. And again, they, they keep voting for him. They keep electing him to be governor. It's not like he's some fringe random person who, who has these terrible beliefs. He's a governor of a state who gets reelected over and over and over again. 
This is the environment that the, that the civil rights movement is, is existing in. It's not like just fringe people don't want African-Americans to have these rights. These are people in high positions of power that are resisting. They're putting troops out there to block children from going to school. I know high schoolers, you, you hate to think about yourselves as children, but I got news for you. Your, your children, 14, 15, 16, 17, some of you are 18, but the majority of you are children. And this man sent the military to block children from going to school. Eisenhower is going to, he is going to promote some civil rights legislation after all of this. And, and really while all of this is happening, uh, he, he is promoting some civil rights legislation. I, I mentioned already, um, he believes strongly in the protecting the vote or the right to vote, right? He's not so much wanting to change segregation. He thinks that it's wrong. He's sympathetic to it. Um, but again, he doesn't think you can, you can legislate that kind of heart change. He thinks that's a, a heart change. But what he does say is that voting rights have to be protected. Every citizen has to be guaranteed their right to vote and that has to be protected. Um, and so he is going to plan on sending a civil rights bill to Congress. Um, and, and again, the, the main thr thrust of this bill, the main intent was to protect the rights of African Americans to vote. Selfishly for Eisenhower, though, it, it's also intended to divide the Democratic Party. Uh, remember, Eisenhower is a Republican, um, and, and he wants to divide the Democratic Party so that hopefully African Americans will be convinced to vote for the Republicans instead, right? They've been voting for the Democrats since, uh, since FDR, but maybe if he can split the Democratic Party, uh, they'll vote for the Republicans. And why would, it, why would the Democratic Party split? Because of those Southern Democrats, those Dixiecrats, if you will, that like Fabus are, think that segregation's okay. Fabus is a Democrat. He's a Southern Democrat at the time. And, and there's this wing of the Democratic Party. We've talked about this. They are pro-segregation, pro-Jim Crow, and they're going to be. They're going to be part of the Democratic Party for a few more years until they leave permanently and, and change parties. But Eisenhower knows that if he sends this civil rights bill to Congress, it's going to divide him. And it could really help the Republicans in the midterm elections of 1958. Kind of Fortunately, right, because, again, the ultimate goal, the noble goal here is, is passing civil rights legislation, which hear me loud and clear. Eisenhower wanted this civil right. He believed in this civil rights legislation, uh, even if he had maybe a small selfish motive. The overarching agenda there was civil rights voting legislation. So so on the one hand, fortunately for him, Lyndon Johnson, who we talked about in the first lecture as vice president, this is back before he's vice president. This is when he is uh, the majority leader in the Senate, the head Democrat in the Senate. Uh, he, again, we talked about it. He has a reputation for holding things together, getting things done, getting a compromise, and he gets it done. He gets it through Congress. He keeps the Democratic Party intact. He keeps uh, this bill intact, and he gets passed the Civil Rights Act of 1957. It's the first piece of civil rights legislation since Reconstruction, right? It's weaker than Eisenhower originally intended it to be because it has to go through several rounds of compromise. But nonetheless, it creates a civil rights division within the Department of Justice, right? The Department of Justice, the, the main prosecutors, uh, law enforcement agency in this government, in this country, uh, it gives them the authority to seek court injunctions against anyone in interfering with the right to vote. In other words, it, it allows them to stop people who are stopping people from voting, if that makes sense, right? It gives them the ability to legal authority to push back. It's not just a state issue. Now the Department of Justice has the authority. They have the ability to go and get the courts to step in and stop these people. It also creates the United States Commission on Civil Rights to investigate any denial of voting rights. Uh, if, if you are an individual, in particular an African-American, you go to vote in say the South in Georgia, and, and you are denied your right to vote, uh, you can file a grievance, you can file a complaint, and the United States Commission on Civil Rights will go and investigate and see if you were denied your right to vote. This, this piece of le legislation is critical. There will be several civil rights acts that we talked about in this unit, but this is one of the important ones, the Civil Rights Act of 1957. It is so impactful that the SCLC, the, the, the Southern uh, Christian Leadership Conference, right, 
they are going to launch a campaign because of this, because of this emphasis on voting. They're going to register. They're going to launch a campaign to register two million new African American voters in response to this bill. They say this is now law. The Civil Rights Act of 1957 is law. We're going to register two million new voters because the way to challenge this is if they get denied the right to vote in the next election, guess what? Now we have a whole bunch of court, court cases to start fighting back against these laws. And so they launch a campaign to register 2 million new African-American voters. We will pick it up next week uh, with, with the rest of and continuing saga of the civil rights movement. But that's, that is the foundation there. That's, that's the groundwork there. Uh, thank you for listening. Make sure you get this summary in your notes and uh, we'll pick it up next week. Uh, looking at uh, the rest or the next phase of this this movement.